I'm Kristen Oates White. And I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. As we record this show, what is now Tropical Storm Harvey is making its way across Louisiana. Harvey made its second landfall early Wednesday morning with sustained winds of 45 miles per hour in Cameron Parish. Fortunately, Harvey pulled dry air from the west into its center. That spared much of Louisiana the heavy rains in the original forecast. The same cannot be said for our neighbors in Texas. The Texas Farm Bureau is reporting that officials there say more than a quarter of the state's cattle herd, 1.2 million head of cattle, are in the 54 counties in the flood disaster area. Back here in Louisiana, Cameron Parish is well known for having strong cattle herds. Twilight's Neil Malasson traveled to the southwestern part of the state to see how ranchers and farmers are faring through the storm. This isn't the wake of a boat. This is a truck driving over flooded fields near Welsh, Louisiana, and a farm road that's almost completely covered. Kevin Birkin's rice fields are used to water, but not like this from what Hurricane Harvey has brought him. He's gotten more than 15 inches of rain from this system. While Birkin says he can handle that, it's just coming at a bad time. This is the third year in a row of below average uh, rice yields. Uh, third year in a row of being difficult for us in the rice industry with low prices. Um, second year in a row of it's pretty major flooding. This is the fifth flood in 15 months. For now, Birkin is concerned that if these fields stay this wet, it could impact his second crop in October and November, which many rice farmers depend on to make a living. The second crop is not all that tall, so it's uh, lower parts of the field, the water gets above them, just kind of depends on how long it's going to stay there. I do anticipate some issues with that, um, but it's not, we shouldn't be too, too bad off, I think, unless we get another 10 or 15 inches, and then we're talking a whole different ballgame. Birkin is lucky that this year he got all of his first crop in. He empathizes, though, with rice farmers across Louisiana and Texas who weren't able to finish in time for Harvey. Birkin was in a similar situation this time last year. For those that have it out there, this is difficult. Um, last year when we had that 20-something inches in August, I had 40% of my crop still out there. So uh, I know what that's like. A lot of two bean pods on here, it's some three. Birkin is also concerned about a soybean crop. There's a saying, soybeans hate wet feet. Uh, this prolonged period of rain, moisture, not sure what it's gonna do on those. They, I've never had a soybean crop look better. So uh, kind of anxious there. I mean, they're potted up from top to bottom. Southwest of Welsh is Cameron Parish, where Harvey made its final landfall. It's cattle country there, and the water isn't going away anytime soon. It seems like a lot of my job here lately is to stand out here in the rain and report on it, but that is what's going on. In fact, right here is uh, Mr. Bozo Cox's rain gauge. He's gotten 26 inches of rain that he's counted since this thing started on Thursday. As of now, it is Tuesday before this storm comes in. It's coming across from this direction and should make landfall on Wednesday. The results of which are unclear to almost everyone, including the National Weather Service, so it's difficult for farmers to prepare for what's going to come. If the marshes are full like they are now, and that's one thing that's worrying everybody is how much rain we're going to get tonight and tomorrow because the marshes act as a catch basin. And if they are full, then the water has no place to go but back up. Cox says his lands are still suffering from last year's flooding. He hasn't been able to fertilize these fields since last fall. More rains fall as we talk, part of what is hindering him now. And whenever we restocked last fall, we did not restock back to the numbers that we had. You know, we figured we'd let the pastures recuperate. We wasn't in a bind on the other ones and it let the old morse grass come back. It will take quite a while to see how much damage Harvey has done across Texas and Louisiana, but one thing is clear. The $10 million in grants for 2016's flooding were a drop in the bucket and nowhere near enough for this year's weather disaster. We need some real serious change, real serious uh, economics coming out of Washington to, to help out. 
because we're talking people who are not going to recover from this. This is life-changing stuff. If you want your food and you want to continue it to be cheap, uh, we've got to take care of the ones that feed us. Something we saw last year with the flooding in Louisiana is long after the storm has moved on, the effects remain. For guys like Bozo Cox, all that water that was further up north is draining his way, which could keep the roads flooded there for quite a while. For our neighbors in Texas, the Brazos River crested more than a week after the first rains from Harvey started to fall in the Houston area. People who had been dry for all that time saw floodwaters enter into their home. I lived in Sugarland, Texas for two years, and this is flooding from my old neighborhood that has never seen water like this. Our former graphic artist, Valerie Foman, had moved near Beaumont, and this is what her home looks like now. We have drone footage from one of her neighbors, and it looks identical to what many in Louisiana went through last year. There are some good stories here, too, though. Louisiana transplants Jay and Stacy Roussel began a dairy goat farm in Needville, Texas, just outside of Houston. While their operation did take on some water, Stacy began delivering fresh goat pops to flood victims and rescue workers in her area. Hi, my name is Stacy Roussel. I own All We Need Farm. We're a small goat milk dairy, and we use our milk to make goat milk gelato pops. Our farm just weathered uh, Hurricane Harvey. And it's been an interesting week or so, first preparing for the storm and then sleeping in my dairy with my animals for three or four nights. Um, we weathered okay. Our community has suffered a lot, though, from the storm. Um, and over the last several days, we've been able to deliver pops to local shelters. She set up a PayPal account to take donations to help flood victims, and we'll link that information on our website at twilighttv.org. And guys, there's just no words for the scope of this disaster. I mean, there are all the statistics are out there, but driving through it in Cameron Parish, I mean, there were water, there was so much water over all the roads there, and that's just from residual rainfall. That doesn't count all that water that's going to start backing up and from storm surge, and, and it's just a, 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 the words fail me. I mean, it, I've seen what happened in Moss Bluff. Moss Bluff got hit pretty hard with a lot of rainfall. Um, it was very reminiscent of what we had around the Baton Rouge area following I was gonna say, August. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know you have personal experience with it, and seeing those homes, seeing Valerie's home, it looks identical to what was in your neighborhood. Yeah, you, you know what these folks are, are going through to some degree. And, and, you know, obviously, especially in the Houston area, this is unprecedented, the number of homes destroyed, damaged. Absolutely. This, I think, will go down surpassing Katrina mm -hmm. as the costliest natural disaster to hit our shores. They're already estimating it at $160 million in damages. And, you know, even though they're not really comparable, I think because we went through what we did last year, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. why we have that empathy with what's going on in Texas. I know we're this week in Louisiana agriculture, but mm -hmm. the correlation is just too strong. And I think you meant to put the B on there, $160 billion? billion. Yes, $160 billion, billion, yeah. billion not million. Yeah, I, I, that happens to me all the time, too. Thank you very much. Neil Malasso. Harvey Strike puts the storm going from corner to corner across Louisiana. From cattle country in the southwest to the most fertile grounds, the delta in the northeast. And in all points in between, Louisiana farmers grow a fair amount of cotton. 200,000 acres according to the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service. However, after a few bad years for cotton in Louisiana, one expert says Harvey could put a nail in the coffin for the industry. Damp and droopy, those are not words one should use when describing cotton, but it's the best description for what LSU Ag Center cotton specialist Dan Frommy is seeing. We could get 10 inches in some places or more, and then the timing is uh, at the worst possible time. Frommy says the already wet summer made conditions ripe for fungal diseases like bowl rot, where the unopened bowls turn black and fall off the plant. But for cotton ready to pick, defoliated cotton, there are bigger issues. You begin to get hard lock. Uh, obviously, the length is exposed to the rain. You get hard lock. It's not going to fluff up. It's going to be harder to pick. If we get a lot of rain, you know, uh, the ba even worse is the, uh, the cotton becomes so heavy in the bowl that it falls out on the ground. And obviously, that's a reduction in yield. A reduction in yield means a reduction in income for farmers and a reduction of income for the cotton gins, the places where the fiber is separated from the seed. There are already fewer gins in Louisiana than in years past. Harvey may make that worse. We've had some hard times. Uh, last year, you know, we had a lot of rain at the end of the year. 
and uh, we were expecting a better crop than what we, we wound up with. That was because of the rain, you know, at harvest time or at defoliation time. This year, uh, you know, just another nail in the coffin. Uh, we have received a lot of rain at planting time. Uh, a lot of the cotton didn't develop a root system like it was supposed to. And then we spent quite a bit of money on uh, plant bug control, bollworm worm control. And, uh, you know, even prior to these rains we're supposed to receive, uh, we really weren't expecting that, you know, good of a crop. So, uh, you know, this just has another potential, you know, to, you know, to uh, really get depressed about cotton in Louisiana. So far, we have not seen the rain totals east of the storm the National Hurricane Center anticipated. That's not a complaint. Believe me, we're happy not to get that rain. We'll have another update on the cotton crop coming up on next week's show. Well, the same areas where farmers grow cotton are where they grow soybeans and corn as well. Daily rains before Harvey made landfall already made it difficult for farmers to harvest their corn. And in the days leading up to Harvey's storms, the race began. Twyla's Carl Wiggers joins us now with a look at what these corn farmers had to do. And it was a mad dash to get that corn out of the fields. What'd you see, Carl? It really was. So last week I showed y'all a video from my family's farm right there in Franklin Parish. And as Harvey made landfall in Texas, farmers across Louisiana, including my family, worked long hours to harvest their beans and corn before the rain set in. That rain finally made its way to Winsboro on Sunday evening. Rusty Wiggers operates the combine at Wiggers Farms. He explains how important his neighbors were during those long days ahead of Harvey. It was some ups and downs, some stress and anxiety, watching Harvey build up. And we really worked hard together and knocked out a lot of corn in a hurry and almost got it all knocked out. You know, we had 2,140 acres and we have 160 left. The risk is the corn sprouting. Louisiana is hot, it's humid, we have rain. That's just what a seed needs to, to grow. Unfortunately, that remaining 160 acres got around two inches of rain when the rain did start. The key moving forward will be if that moisture stays and what kind of wind Harvey brings to northeast Louisiana. And guys, you're starting to see it kind of fall apart in some of this rain. I mean, I know the southwest is getting a lot of rain right now, but some of these forecasts are showing maybe it won't be as bad as, as, as it seems like it was going to be. And I can only hope for all the farmers up up that way, there's a lot of corn and beans to get that it's that way. Well, you know, it was really fortunate uh, what Dan Frommy told me whenever we were talking off camera was that it looks like about 80% of the corn across the state's already been harvested. So you only have 20% of the crop still out there that could be damaged. That's still a lot. And if it's, if it's your farm where that 20% is, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And, and with prices where they are right now and, you know, the the way that profits are in farming right now, that 20% <laughs> may be all there is. Maybe all there is for a farmer to, to make any kind of money and to, to pay his bills at the end of the year. Well, the corn might be out, but I can tell you that there's a whole lot of soybeans left in the field. There are. And they need some, some sunshine and dry weather <laughs> ahead. I hope for your sake <laughs> that's the case. I hope for all the farmer's sake. And I hope it's not too late for cotton, but Carl Wiggers, great take on the story. We've shown you how Harvey has the potential to damage crops, but what does that mean for you and rural economies? Twyla's A.J. Sabine takes a look at what could be the economic impact of Harvey on Louisiana's $12 billion a year ag industry. As Harvey rains down all across southwest Louisiana and beyond, the markets for ag crops, such as rice, soybeans, and cotton, soak up uncertainty. LSU Ag Center Professor of Ag Economics Mike Deliberto says the ag market has reacted to this historic storm. Going into harvest with harvesting second crop or tune rice, the damage that's likely to be caused to soybeans, not only can growers potentially expect to see increased production costs uh, for insecticides, fungicides, uh, inputs of that nature, but also reduce combine efficiency is always something growers uh, are going to be concerned at. Deliberto explains that second crop rice could be particularly vulnerable to storm damage, which could undercut news of a new export deal with China. Before Harvey made landfall, USDA rated 70 percent of the soybean crop good to excellent here in Louisiana. As the storm moves northeasterly, those numbers could be in jeopardy. Almost half the soybeans have already matured. Some of the early maturing soybeans have already been cut. I think the USDA estimated about 25% of the beans had already left the field. However, sprouting in pods, pod deterioration, increased harvest costs, 
uh, the potential for increased stink bud pressure as we move later in the growing season. Uh, do growers use harvest aids? Uh, can that deteriorate pods anymore? These are questions I think that are going to be continually asked by growers and of agents alike uh, to see if they can minimize the economic loss from those crops. Fuel prices as well as shipping costs could also be impacted by Harvey. Deliberto says don't be surprised if you see a jump in price in both sectors after Harvey is history. Industry experts are thinking that you may see some volatility in your fuel prices. That's likely to affect any kind of trucking or any harvesting operations for the growers that still have crops left in the field. Always a concern too, fuel comprises a large share of variable production costs. Always linked to that too as being a major driver of profitability. The path of Harvey, uh, corn and soybeans, those two point ports don't account for a large amount of the exports that we send to our foreign buyers, mm -hmm. but the part of New Orleans controls about 60% of corn and soybeans that go to our overseas buyers. We've seen big rallies in soybean shipments to China especially, and anything that could disrupt that port would have substantial economic impact uh, to our, our ad sector of the, of the state's economy. For this week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm A.J. Sabine. It may not be until after farmers harvest all of their crops that we know the true economic impact of Harvey. That's when we'll see yield losses in cotton, soybeans, and maybe even sugarcane. We'll bring you those updates in the coming weeks. Still to come on Twyla, how the Farm Bureau is helping firefighters save lives. But first, we'll bring you online to show you the role of social media in this disaster. Stay with us. Before you sweeten your morning joe, Before the icing on the cake. Before the sugar hits the shelf. It begins with a family of sugarcane farmers dedicated to growing Louisiana for more than 220 years. The sugarcane growers of Louisiana, making life sweeter naturally. Sugarcane, sweet sugarcane. I now hope they're fighting today. I hope they are. Find your place in the country and the lender who can get you there. Find Louisiana Land Bank. Financing for country homes, recreational property, farms and ranches, and agribusiness. Farming is my way of life. I chose this career, but farming chose me. A lot of people ask you what you do and I tell them I'm a farmer. I'm a cattleman. I am a fisherman. I'm a scientist. I'm a steward of the land. I am a farm woman. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am a Farm Bureau. Louisiana oysters, salty, sweet, and delicious. But have you ever thought about what happens to all those oyster shells? Most of them end up in trash cans and landfills. The Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana is changing this with its Oyster Shell Recycling Program. And you can help by visiting these participating restaurants. It's a simple and delicious way to restore our coast. The shells will then be used to sustain and rebuild oyster reefs. Remember, once you shuck them, don't just chuck them. When Hurricane Harvey hit Texas last week, social media rose to the challenge as a force for good. CNN reported that this is the first time the United States has seen a disaster of this scale in the era of social media. The last time a hurricane ranked Category 3 or higher made landfall in the country, Twitter hadn't even been created yet, and Harvey made it clear that social media has revolutionized the search and rescue process. With local 911 systems choked with calls during the storm and limited cell phone service, many Houston residents reached out for help on Facebook and Twitter. They tweeted their addresses to emergency officials. They organized rescue missions through Facebook groups, and they posted harrowing pictures to emphasize 
just how high the flood waters were. A photo of soaking wet elderly patients at La Bella Vida Nursing Home just south of Houston went viral after a Florida woman, Kim McIntosh, posted it on Sunday. McIntosh told CNN that she posted it out of desperation. Her mother owns the nursing home and was having a hard time getting help. McIntosh said she shared the photo to try to get as much attention from people who could get there with the boat. The nursing home was evacuated on Sunday afternoon. Just like the Louisiana floods of 2016, we saw a constant theme shining on social media during this disaster. Acts of kindness and helpful, but helpfulness abound. At the center of the rescue efforts in Houston, Louisiana's own Cajun Navy. The same group of volunteers who launched rescue missions during last year's flood in South Louisiana headed to Texas on Monday morning with more than 100 boats in tow to help stranded flood victims. This time, the Cajun Navy caught the attention of major news outlets and government officials across the nation. The Washington Post, CNN, USA Today, MSNBC, and Fox News all published stories praising the Cajun Navy for reaching out to help people hundreds of miles away. Well, what are we calling these people from Louisiana? God bless them. Uh, our Cajun Navy, you know, our American Cajun Navy. That, that helped us look for him. Houston's chief of police choked up as he showed his appreciation to the group of Good Samaritans from Louisiana. Part of the reason why the Cajun Navy has been so effective during disasters is their skilled use of social media. Nearly 200,000 people like their Facebook page, which makes it easier to get the word out for help. Since Sunday morning, stranded residents in Texas have been reaching out to the Navy via Twitter and Facebook using the Cajun Navy hashtag. On social media, we also saw an under-the-radar breed of hero go about business as usual. As the floodwaters rushed in, members of the ag community saddled up to help their neighbors in need last week. In southwest Louisiana, local farmers banded together with equipment and manpower to help other farmers finish their harvest before the storm rolled in. In Texas, we watched numerous videos of ranchers on horseback moving cattle through high waters to higher ground. A CNBC reporter's video went viral on Twitter as police helped to move a herd of cattle through the streets of Dayton, Texas. Before the winds calm and the waters recede, help is already rolling in from other farmers and ranchers across the country. You see, the Gulf Coast and the ag community in particular are no stranger to hardships. As difficult as the road to recovery will be, they will pick up the pieces, they'll put on their boots, and they will go to work to rebuild their farms and their life. Times like this show the true resiliency of the human spirit, and social media simply illustrates that spirit to the rest of the world. And I can tell you, Avery, that it's terrible what we're seeing in Houston, and you know better than all of us the pain that, is, that can be caused from a flooding house, but it, it's wonderful to see an entire community and a state and a nation come together through a disaster. Yeah, but what we've got to keep in mind is this is not a one week thing. This is not a one day thing. This is going to be year long, possibly years long of recovery for each and every person. And we're going to, we're, there's, there's still mental trauma that goes on there. I mean, when, when Harvey was coming in, I stood for a moment on my staircase looking down and I could still see where my walls were cut away. So you multiply that by the population you have in Houston. Mm -hmm. Houston alone, 6.5 million people. The entire population of the state of Louisiana is 4.5 million. Kind of put that in perspective. This is a huge disaster and we're going to have to be there for the long haul. Our good neighbors helping them out. That's very true. Well, still to come on Twyla, we take a break from the storm coverage to take you to a stomping good time. Stay with us. Landowners are minding the Louisiana forest for our grandchildren. A place for wildlife recreation, lumber for homes. It's the right thing to do. Forestry, covering half our state, all of our hearts. This is the moment I knew. His future had no boundaries. 
there are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. I am a giant panda bear, love you, Mamu. I almost went extinct, but I'm not because of you. I am a ground spoon, I almost was too. If it wasn't for the help of the San Diego Zoo, how about you join us? Save it as a tortoise. We need your help to bring species back, so bring us back from the brink of extinction. Bring us back from the brink of extinction. I am a brain. In North Louisiana, Harvey could not keep Landry Vineyards from celebrating its great harvest. This year, Jeff Landry and his crew harvested about eight tons of Lenoir red grapes. That's enough to produce about 16 barrels of wine. Twyla's Carl Wiggers brings us the sights and sounds from Landry Vineyards annual Stomp Fest harvest celebration. Well, this is our Stomp Fest, and we love doing the Stomp Fest. You know, Stomp Fest is an opportunity for us to show people that we are very passionate about growing grapes here in Louisiana. They see the grapes, they see the grape vines, they get to stomp in the grapes. And I don't know what it is about stomping in the grapes, but the ladies just love it. And you know, it really is an age old tradition of stomping in the grapes during the harvest. Uh, of course, it was the method at one time of, of actually making wine. People love to have a good time. We love Louisiana music. We have great talent here in Louisiana. Let's use the local, local musicians that we have to provide the, the entertainment. Today is, a, is the Stomp Fest. Celebrate the bringing in of the harvest. This is celebrating Lenoir, which is called Little Black. It's a little small black grape that we use for port production. We've just created a new wine with it called Louisiana Heat. The ladies again are stomping in the grapes. They put their footprints on the back of a Landry Vineyards t-shirt and we do a Lucy look-alike contest. If you look around, you'll see a bunch of ladies dressed up like Lucy. But we're real happy about being here. The community has really embraced what we're doing. We love all people coming out and having a great time here at Landry Vineyards. Kids all down there love, loving it, having a good time down there, throwing balls and enjoying it. We also do a wagon ride where the, where the kids love to ride on the, on the uh, wagon, but it's a real tour of the vineyard. The main thing we're trying to accomplish here, let people see we are serious about growing grapes here in Louisiana and producing quality wine. To learn more about the events at Landry Vineyards, visit our website at twilatv.org. And Avery, I've been, I can tell you, it's a good time. Uh, it looked like it was, uh, although I get a little grossed out when I think about all the feed and grapes, but you know, they don't use them they, for the wine, so that, that makes me feel just a little bit better. They make a point to tell everyone that. Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll have a better idea of how Harvey is affecting our state's farmers and ranchers. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twilatv.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We're putting a lot of stuff up storm-related. <laughs> Uh, as we get it, so you don't have to wait the entire week before you get that information. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.